Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out this evening, so to speak, and tuning in to watch the presentation, and most importantly, for supporting the Penobscot Marine Museum. Um, I have uh, been a pilot on the bay, as Gina said, since 1992. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is a little bit of the past history of piloting on Penobscot Bay, what's currently going on, and where we might be headed in the future. So please bear with me. You'd think after two years, we would all be experts with Zoom, but I'm still learning the ropes, so to speak. So I am going to give a little presentation here, if I can find the right screen. So what I wanted to start with is, uh, I'm gonna ask Gina in a moment to run a little video while I'm trying to figure out Zoom. And what this video will show you is a uh, time-lapsed uh, video presentation of this vessel, uh, or one very much like it. This is a typical tanker that comes into Penobscot Bay. And uh, this particular ship went up to Bucksport. So the time-lapse video shows the vessel undocking from Bucksport. It was uh, some number of years ago, you'll notice by the steam coming from the still standing paper mill that it was uh, when, the, when the paper mill was running in Bucksport and it's obviously in the middle of winter because of all the ice. So Gina, if you wouldn't mind running that right now, I'll narrate through it. So there we see our assist tug coming out. There's another one on the after end of the vessel you can't see because obviously this is shot from the bridge wing, port bridge wing. That's the oil dock in Bucksport. Very frosty morning. Um, that's not fog that you see on the river. It's what we refer to as vapor when the air temperature is so cold on a dry winter day that the air immediately above the water has a hard time supporting the moisture. In a moment, you're going to see Fort Knox. And the ship is cast off the tugs now. They're under their own power, approaching the Penobscot Narrows Bridge. You can see the abutments for the old bridge right there. In a moment, when you see the tug on the port side duck ahead of us, he's going to be getting in front of the tanker because the um, monument on Odom Ledge is going to be on the port side which is a big old rock pile right in the middle of the river. And then dead ahead of the vessel, you might notice the old remnants of the fertilizer dock at Sandy Point. There's the buoy, there's the dock. That's North Castine dead ahead and Fort Point on the starboard bow. You're gonna see Fort Point Monument just passing by the port bow. There's the condos at Cape Jellison and Sears Island is dead ahead. So that's that vessel going down the river. We get those Irving tankers quite regularly, sometimes as much as two or three a week, but that's pretty typical of the size ship that runs into both Sears Port as well as Bucksport. So a lot of people wonder what ships are required to take a state pilot. Basically, it's gonna to amount to every foreign flagship that has a draft more than nine feet and any US flag uh, vessel that's going or coming from a foreign port. So even domestic US flagships will have to use a pilot when they're uh, going to or from Europe or Canada. In Penobscot Bay, we see about 110 to 140 ships uh, annually. Depends on you know, the economy at the time or what industries are doing well, which industries aren't. And that's a combination of both Searsport, which sees the lion's share of the work, as well as um, Bucksport, which sees about 20 or 30 ships a year. A, a few vessels are still going up the river to um, Bangor to the to Brewer to the Chinbro facility up there, 
but that's um, the river's fairly quiet now compared to what it used to be. And the cargoes that they're bringing um, are primarily energy related, um, bringing in heating oil, gasoline, diesel fuel, jet, um, kerosene, six oil, asphalt. For the bulk products that we bring in, um, we bring in a lot of road salt. Tomorrow morning, I'll be getting underway from Rockland and going out and getting a 50,000 ton um, road salt ship and bringing it into Anchor tomorrow afternoon in Searsport. We bring in petroleum coke, which is burned down in Thomaston at the Dragon Cement plant, as well as iron oxide, gypsum. Uh, we import some clay slurry, which is clay in a liquid form. Uh, we do a lot of project cargo in Searsport. The operator there, Sprague, has done a great job handling windmill components for, um, for uh, Maine's burgeoning wind industry. Most, most wind turbines in Maine that are standing right now are imported through the port of Searsport. And we also, interestingly, have started in the last couple of years importing wood pulp for a paper mill down in Southern Maine, and we export scrap steel. Now, the role of the pilot, this is one that um, sometimes people get wrong. Um, you know, you'll read a lot written sometimes by people that, that say the pilot's only an advisor to the master. The master is always the master. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't lose any authority. We don't take control of his ship, but we do direct the navigation of the vessel in state waters. So for all intents and purposes, what that means is that we are we are conning the ship. We're giving the helm orders. We're giving the engine orders. Um, you know, we're talking on the radio. We're coordinating. We're, we're determining the speed of the transit. We're coordinating with the tugboats. Um, we're talking to the other traffic on the bay. So we we're orchestrating the movement of those vessels while they're in state waters. Um, the captain is still the captain. He's still in charge. If he's got a question or a concern about what we're doing. He's bound to intervene and, and say something. And you know, fortunately, um, while it might sound problematic to have two, two people in positions of authority on the bridge of the ship, there rarely is a problem. Most captains are extremely appreciative of what we bring when we come to the job and they're quite relieved when a local pilot is aboard. We uh, are somewhat unique on the East Coast in Penobscot Bay. We do the docking and undocking of the ships um, not just the harbor piloting, but we actually are what you would consider docking masters as well. So when the tugs come out, we talk to the tugs on the radio, we tell them how to make fast to the vessel, and then we're given the commands to those vessels um, when we're docking and undocking. In most ports on the East Coast, you actually have a two pilot system. Portland has this where you have the harbor pilots, they go out to sea, bring the ship into the harbor, and then they turn it over to a docking master, We're, we, we do both up in Penobscot Bay. So I'd like to talk about how it was done in the old days. Um, basically, it was done primarily with visual references. Um, perhaps some of you have heard the adage, uh, the old aviation adage about keep your head out of the cockpit. Well, in piloting, it's look out the window. Um, in, in, uh, in piloting, the real, the real core and essence of piloting is to have uh, an instant appreciation of where your vessel is at and if, if everything is safe, just based on what you might call a pilot's eye, just by looking at your visual surroundings. Do you know you're in good water? Are you, are you, you, know, are you seeing any problems developing? Um, are you on the right course? Are you where you want to be with relation to geographic features around you? And the best way to do that is with ranges and visual references. Um, one of my fondest memories of piloting is the first few years that I was training with uh, my mentor, Captain Bill Abbott from Belfast. And he used to drum all these different ranges into my head. And sometimes it got a little bit ridiculous. You know, he, he'd say like, steady her up, Dave, on that old boathouse that used to be there. And uh, look, look for that old pine tree. It's not there, but you can see the stump sort of a thing. Um, but, but more accurately and still used today, uh, I just gave you an example coming down the Penobscot River with that uh, tanker. Um, one of the ranges that we look for, a, a leading indicator, I should say, is that old fertilizer dock. 
and being in line with the buoy off of Fort Point. If those two landmarks are in a line as you come down the river on about a 182 heading, you know that you're going to be in good water and pass safely clear of an 18 foot spot that sticks out from the prospect shore. Another example of that is when you're northbound in the traffic lane in Penobscot Bay, if you're exactly where you're supposed to be on a, on a course of due north, 000, you should be pointing directly at Duck Trap Mountain. So those are things that sound very simple and, and they are. You, you want those very simple, very quick references to be able to check. Um, you know, some days the electronics don't work. So it's really important to have the basics of, about your visual references down. The old days, you know, old formula, all navigators know speed time times equals distance. Lead line, this was way, way before my time, of course, but they actually would use the lead line in old days for piloting to determine their position just based on bottom characteristics. Sound was another interesting one. Uh, in the real old days, if you were in the river and you got caught in vapor, you could sound your, your whistle and you could tell your distance off of a hazard by timing how long it took for the echo to return back to the vessel. And then after World War II, with the advent of, of radar, we started using parallel indexing, where if you know you want to be one mile off of an island or some geographic feature, you set your VRM, your variable range marker, up on a mile, and then you set your electric, electronic bearing line onto that tangent to that one mile range, and that EBL runs tangent to the geographic point you're trying to stay a mile off of. So in that way you can stay one mile off of, a, of a, a geographic point even when you're five, six, seven miles away just by using the parallel indexing. So what's, what's different, what's changed since the old days about how we do piloting and navigating today? Very significantly, this part has not changed. This, the, the core of the job are those visual references still looking out the window, still knowing your ranges, still appreciating with a pilot's eye if the vessel is in safe water. We have the benefits now of uh, carrying GPS and ECTUS electronic chart display information systems, which are like moving maps. And um, they're, they're a tremendous tool and an aid in our job. And we do still do radar ranges and parallel indexing. So what this chart is illustrating, this is a screenshot of one of our portable pilot navigation units. And what you're looking at here is my unit as I'm bringing a ship up through Tubush Channel. Um, the name, uh, it's the small ship right down here in red. That's the ship I'm piloting. If you look very close, you'll see an arrow and it says Penobscot Pilot. That's actually not my ship. That's my pilot boat, the Penobscot pilot that's following close aboard because they're, they've just put me on that ship a little while ago and they're heading back up to get another pilot off of this outbound vessel, the Asphalt Seminole. Now, what this electronic chart display information system, this pilot portable navigation unit allows us to do is know with a tremendous degree of accuracy, are we in the traffic lane? Are we following the recommended route? So you can see here, I'm up about 94 feet left of the dead center of the four tenth of a mile wide traffic lane. And I get good information on other vessels. Here's all the other AIS targets in the immediate area. All the other ships that have AIS are displayed right there. And I can use the AIS to say, well, listen, I'm inbound and this tanker is outbound. If nobody changes course, we both follow in the same route. When are we going to meet? Well, we're going to meet in 23 minutes and five seconds right at this location. So that's a really nice tool uh, to be able to have. Voyage planning is something that mariners are doing um, a lot of these days. It's a, a requirement now for mates. And we try and, and uh, complement the arriving ships by helping them with their voyage planning. Long before a vessel arrives in Maine, we're commu communicating with the ship through the agent and we're giving them information about tide, weather windows, um, underkill clearances, 
port specific information can be found in these publications like the Coast Pilot and just looking on the chart. So back in about 1996-98, we uh, led the initiative to create the Penobscot Bay recommended route for deep draft vessels. Um, prior to this, we had the same routes that we were running, but the problem was as more and more fishing vessels were on the bay and more and more recreational boats were on the bay, um, they didn't know what routes we were following. And we'd try and stay consistent in our, in our routes, but without anybody knowing what those routes are, they really couldn't anticipate them. So by creating the Penobscot Bay recommended route, it, it gave a clear illustration of the path that the ships would follow as they go up and down Penobscot Bay. It allowed them to do advanced voyage planning like they're required to do now. So rather than look at a blank chart of Penobscot Bay and draw their own route, they can look at the chart now and see, okay, when the pilot gets aboard here at the pilot station, here's how we're going to proceed to Searsport. And they can lay out their courses accordingly. Very importantly, it, it shows the places where we're likely to change course. And that's a big one because you know, you can be out on your recreational vessel on Penobscot Bay and see a tanker far away and look like, oh gosh, that guy's going to pass miles away. But then all of a sudden you might see the ship make a course change and start coming right at you. So by having the uh, charts illustrated on uh, the route illustrated on the charts or an electronic charting system, you know, you can follow the path. You can know with a high degree of certainty. It's like, okay, now that ship's changed direction. He's coming this way because he's following this route outbound to the east. Keeps the ship in really good water. We have a lot of deep water in Penobscot Bay, but it tends to get really shallow and rocky really fast. Very importantly, um, the route, uh, a big goal of the route, and I think a big uh, achievement of the route is that it minimizes the impacts to fishing gear. Um, this route would not have been possible to get the government to create for us had we not had the support of the Maine Lobstermen's Association. Um, I spoke to them and, and they very quickly uh, realized the benefits of seeing the routes clearly indicated on the charts and the chart plotters. This, this all happened at a time when chart plotters were starting to be readily adapted on fishing vessels. So by having the chart, route, the routes rather, right on the charts, it allows all the fishermen to know, here's where the, here's where the ships are going to be. Now, this is not a, 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 a regulated navigation area, an RNA. That recommended route is just as the name says, it's a recommended route. However, we follow it um, unless the unless traffic, you know, unless an emergency happens and we really have to leave the route. But our, our commitment to the fishing community is that we try to stay to the middle of this route as much as possible. And they still fish in the traffic lane. A lot of mariners get confused when they see fishing gear in the recommended route. It was never meant to be an exclusion zone. And I don't think we would have had the fishermen support if we said you got to keep the gear out. But what it does do is it lets them understand, hey, look, if you guys are going to fish here, there's a greater likelihood of losing gear in this area. And that's been a fair trade off for most of the folks that I've spoken with in the fishing industry. They tend to be able to catch for gear if they lose a toggle or a buoy and get it back. Um, but it's been a real boon to the to the fishing industry and to our working with the fishing industry to minimize gear impacts. And again, it's on all, all charts all around the world now. Anybody that comes to Penobscot Bay on a commercial ship knows those routes. We use the route in conjunction with the security calls. We give security calls regularly at, um, at known uh, points along the route or distinguishing points along the route, specifically, say, a, a geographic point like off of Camden or a buoy like the PA buoy. You would hear myself or one of my partners on either channel 13 or channel 16 say, security call, Tanker, New England, southbound, outbound, West Penobscot Bay, recommended route, bound for sea to the east via Matinicus, currently off Camden Harbor. And any concern traffic, please respond. So that way you know 
okay, there's a tanker coming down the recommended route. He's in the West Penobscot Bay portion of it right now. He's off Camden and he's going out to sea via Matinicus. Hopefully it lets people keep clear of ships. Now, this image was sent to me by a colleague down in uh, Delaware Bay. So this was not Penobscot Bay. We don't have container ships on Penobscot Bay, but I have had some instances like this. And this is what we uh, are trying to um, avoid by having the recommended route, by using security calls on our website. Uh, if you'll go there after the presentation or any other time, you'll see that we have something called a safe passage brochure that pretty much directs recreational vessels how to keep clear of the commercial traffic on Penobscot Bay. There's, there's really no reason. It's, it's a big bay. There's a lot of users. There's commercial ships. There's fishermen. There's kayakers. There's sailors. There's power boaters. So we all have to use the bay together. And a, a little common sense will go a long way in keeping everyone safe. Um, this, uh, this slide is interesting. It shows training. We're required to keep our state license. We're required to have 40 hours of training uh, every five years to renew our license. And this is some of the best ship handling training I ever got. This is called manned model training. And it's at the premier facility for manned model training in the world in Grenoble, France. It's extremely expensive. And the only reason uh, we are able to get our pilots, all of our pilots have been through manned model training. Some of them have been to this facility, some have been to others, but we are able to do this because we have a memori memorandum of understanding with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. And they actually dedicate a portion of what's called the surface fund, which is a, a cleanup fund. It's, it's uh, funded by a tax on every gallon of oil that moves across the state. Um, and it's used primarily, it's used to, you know, clean up a spill or protect against oil spills. But with that idea in mind, they have made a portion of that funding available for us for training like this, which we could not otherwise afford. And it's a, it's been a great, it's been a great benefit to all of us to have that program and to get that training. So this is uh, what I say is a training put into practice. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road here. This is a 106 foot wide ship, uh, which is pretty standard for the beam of, of most, uh, most Panamax ships that we get. Uh, going into this spray dock, the liquid dock, what we call the liquid dock is right here on the left. And then this dock on the right is the new dock, quote new dock. Uh, it's the bulk dock where, where the bulk cargoes and break bulk and project cargoes come in. And so the distance between these two docks is about 240 feet and the ship is 106. And if you haven't noticed it right now, by now, there's an 80 foot, 85 foot long tugboat right there with this stern just sticking out. So we've got, you know, we've got about 25, 30 feet, 20 feet here, maybe 35 here, something like that. Um, it's a tight fit. It's a tight fit. And uh, it's, it's, you know, something that... <laughs> still 30 years into it, it's still um, something that, that is a, a challenge. This is uh, our latest pilot boat, very proud and pleased to have made this acquisition back in 2019. It's not a new boat, we could not afford a new one, but uh, some friends of ours down in, uh, in uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia pilots, uh, we're, we're going to be getting through with this boat it was about 25 years old and they were getting some new ones and they called us up and, and made us a fair offer, a fair deal to get this boat. We brought it up in 2019. We, we actually just refinished powering the boat, repowering the boat um, about eight months ago. We put in brand new tier three engines again. We were able to take advantage of a program that the main DEP runs that uh, get, gets rid of old, uh, you know, kind of polluting, not very, not very um, clean diesel engines, which this boat had, it had old Detroit diesels on it, two stroke diesels. And we replaced it with tier three diesel engines, 500 horsepower tier three diesel engines. Um, so that was another uh, very, very much appreciated assistance from the main DEP. And this boat is about 53 feet in length, 
and it's twice as heavy as our 47 foot boat was that that served us so well for 20 something years and is now doing the work up in Bar Harbor in this in the uh, cruise ship season but this is a this is a really important piece of equipment because this is what the type of equipment we need to do the job safely and quite frankly I I, I wish we'd have had this boat 30 years ago even with its added enhanced capabilities and seaworthiness. Um, you know, these pictures were taken about four seconds apart. So it's tough to see from the bridge wing of a ship, which is where I was when I took these pictures, but sometimes it doesn't look too bad out there. You know, it's, oh, it's maybe five to six foot. And then you look out and you see your boat just about burying its bow. Um, that's, that's a solid six to eight running right there. So that's one of the reasons that we need a boat like this. And um, Gene, I think we are at the point where I'd like you to run a little video if you don't mind. So this is uh, my colleague, Captain Strong, uh, boarding uh, the tanker New England, I believe it's New England, uh, at night, just to give you an idea of what the job looks like. Just trying to avoid some lobster gear there. So that's just a little little idea of what it's like. That's actually not too bad a job. Um, but we go out in some pretty bad conditions. So our boats are extremely important to us, as well as the great captains that we have driving them. So I wanted to mention the other side of the business. I've spoken quite a bit about Penobscot Bay and oil tankers and things, but um, a, a, actually as big a part of our business for the last few years has been cruise ships, specifically cruise ships in and out of the port of Bar Harbor. Penobscot Bay has had a smattering of them, but really uh, Bar Harbor is where most of the cruise ships go to the point where in 2019, pre-pandemic, we did about 150 um, cruise vessels up there. Um, so that's a, it's a really important part of our business. And we've been greatly affected by the pandemic by not having any of those vessels up there for the last two years. Um, something that I've explained to a lot of people is that, uh, you know, we're a small company and we don't distinguish one end of the operation from the other. It's all, all of our resources between our equipment and our pilots are pooled together. And it was the growth in the cruise ship industry, which actually allowed us to increase our pilot boat capabilities and to repower the boats. Both boats have been repowered. Now the, the old Penobscot pilot uh, just got repowered a couple of months ago. It's not even in the water yet. And we're really hoping for a return to cruise shipping coming back to Bar Harbor next year in some way, shape or form. There has been a lot of talk in the papers about cutting back on the cruise ships in Bar Harbor. And I can understand why that discussion is going on, but uh, it would be uh, tremendous. Obviously it would hurt our business tremendously if they were to be gone, but importantly, the pilotage system that we maintain, not just the pilots, but the equipment, the infrastructure to keep us going and going safely would be severely compromised if we didn't have that stream of revenue. So we're 
we're hoping that 2022 is the year that the cruise ships come back and um, knock on wood, we'll see if it happens. A little bit about the history, the, the uh, B&A Railroad um, used to go from, it, it, b &A was founded in 1891, but it connected with the Port of Searsport in 1905. And so what that, what that did was it connected Searsport to Arusta County and really led to a boom in paper products and import of chemicals and export of potatoes and things like that. But that's all changed now. And a few years ago, there was a number of different owners of the railroad and um, subsequent to a couple of people buying it and selling it and bankruptcies and so on and so forth, it was recently acquired by the um, Canadian Pacific Railway, which is a major, major uh, North American rail line. And what that's done is it's kind of shifted now our hinterland. We're not so much doing those products from, from Northern Maine, Arista County now. We've really sort of shifted to where our hinterland is more to the west of Searsport. So, you know, right now we haven't really experienced uh, any real growth from the railroad acquisition. It only happened about two and a half years ago. But in time, uh, when we do have growth, I suspect that it'll probably be traffic that's bound for or originating from points to the west of Maine, not so much Maine itself. The kind of ship that would do work like that might be something like a vessel like this. This is a, a what we call a handy max bulk ship. This is what I'm going out to get tomorrow morning. Um, it's about 50,000 tons. The one I'm bringing in is gonna have 42,000 tons worth of salt. These ships are routinely about 630 feet in length, 106 feet wide with a 40 to 42 foot draft. And they can carry you know, upwards of 50 or 55,000 tons of cargo. Um, when you think about the Midwest and the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes are limited to ships that are no more than about 26 feet in draft and about 26,000 tons of cargo. So the biggest ship going into the Great Lakes through the locks up there could carry about half of what an average size ship can carry coming into Searsport. So I think that we have um, really good potential down the road when the railroad decides to invest more in Searsport um, in vessels like this, as well as um, higher value things like break bulk cargoes, project cargoes. But ships like this, they're the most uh, one of the most common sized bulk ships in the world and they can carry all kinds of wheat, grains, rice, um, ores, minerals, uh, forest products. So they're, they're very handy ships and um, we're not going to see, I don't believe, I don't think Searsport is ever going to be a container ship port per se, but I don't think we need to be to be successful. I think attracting more of the vessels that we're already handling and we know we can handle well, such as this one and some other ones I'll show you, um, I think that's where we're gonna really see some, some growth in the future. This is a nice um, picture. I like this one a lot because this sort of shows the transition that we're in right now. In the foreground, we've got a little freighter, well, obviously with windmill blades on, on the deck waiting to go to the dock. And in the background at the bulk dock where the cranes are raised, there's another ship that's also unloading windmill parts. Those parts, are uh, towers, they're windmill towers to support the structure. And then between the two of them is a, an oil tanker. And Searsport, like so many ports, the, the, the history around the port is largely tied to energy use. You know, years and years ago, it used to be coal. There was a lot of coal that was brought into Searsport. Coal was brought all the way up to Bangor. Um, and then that tr transition to, to, to uh, liquid petroleum, oil heating oil, six oil. Six oil is pretty much gone by the wayside now with the advent of the uh, Maritimes and Northeast gas pipeline. Most of the heavy industry in the state is tied into the gas pipeline, so six oil is gone. So there's always been this theme to the port about energy. And, and now, of course, uh, Governor Mills has got a, a very big initiative. They're trying very hard to make Maine a leader in the offshore floating wind industry. And Searsport, as you may have read, is going to be a big hub of that. So this is kind of this is kind of the direction we are going in, and um, 
these are really these are really interesting neat ships to handle to see come in and I, I wish we had more of them and I, I hope we can look forward to more of them in the future. Um, speaking about the future and emissions and going green, this is a, an interesting slide that was put together by a um, shipping company that was offering an alternative. It was basically designed around flower delivery. And what this company was doing was showing how much more uh, efficient and less carbon intensive it is to transport flowers by refrigerated container ship than it is by aircraft, which by the way, is the way most imported flowers tend to be delivered. But I like the graphic because it shows very clearly the CO2 emitted by various forms of transportation to move one ton of goods one kilometer. And obviously that's what's where air traffic is right there, air freight. Um, get back to terrestrial modes, you got trucks, 47 grams, trains, quite a bit better, considerably better at 18 grams. And then ocean shipping, three grams of CO2 emissions per ton of goods moved one kilometer. The single best thing we can do in the future moving forward in terms of state policies is to tie those two least impactive forms of transportation together. It's very important. We're very blessed to have railroads coming down to our ports like Sears Port and in Rockland and in Portland. And I think that as a policy, as a state policy, would be, we would be very well advised to make sure that those places where those two modes of transportation come together are not lost to things like, you know, condominium development or vacation development or recreational development, because they're going to be very important in the future to cut down on emissions on a grand scale. So we're, we're very fortunate in this state. We have a lot of opportunity, and I don't think we've, we've met it all yet. Okay, well, thank you for bearing with my horrible technical skills, but that is the, that is the uh, slide portion our, of our presentation. Thank you. We do have a few questions, so I'll ask them. And again, if anyone else has questions, if you put them in the chat box, then I can read them out and we can talk about them. Uh, so first up, Sipperly, who's the curator here at Penobscot yes, Marine hello, Museum. Yes, hello, Sipperly. <laughs> she brings up the painting that we have, um, uh, the painting that we have of the Manny Swan, which um, it's the Barkentine outrunning the pilots. Have you ever had someone refuse service? Um, no, I have not. However, I have a story. That's the problem. Whenever you ask a mariner, they've got stories. I, I brought a cruise ship into Bar Harbor a number of years ago. Um, I went out, I boarded the vessel. They did what they were supposed to. Everything went fine. But it was a little bit awkward. Once I got on board, uh, did the master pilot exchange, handed over the con to me, and I was driving. And a little bit further up the bay after I had boarded, the Coast Guard came out and the Coast Guard directed the ship to slow down because they wanted to put a boarding party on. And the captain, um, Italian captain, he, he said, no, I'm, I'm not slowing down. We slowed down once for the pilot already. We're, we got a schedule to keep. I'm not slowing down. And I, I looked at him and I'm like, Captain, it's the Coast Guard. <laughs> You might want to slow down and let the Coast Guard come aboard. No, no pilot. I, 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 I'm not going to slow down. Let's just let's just go to anchor. Um, we went to anchor and the Coast Guard ended up boarding at anchor and doing their their sweep and their inspections there. But um, in a curious and unfortunate turn of fate, that captain's name was Captain Scatino, and he was later the captain of the Costa Concordia. Wow. Which, Do you ever... that, that should mean something to your listeners. <laughs> Do you have ever have problems with language when you're talking to captains? If you're having lengthy discussions, language can be a problem. But moving a big ship is a surprisingly straightforward operation. Um, by international law, everyone is, so all mariners are supposed to speak and understand English. Um, so to move the ship, really, there's not a lot you have to do. You know, this is port, this is starboard. I'm, I'm very good with my hands. So when I give engine orders, you know, half ahead, slow astern, um, 
you know, if you if you just think about what it takes to move the ship, engine orders and rudder orders, it's not too much of a problem. Where you get into uh, language barriers is when you're trying to explain something that takes a lot of language, like, you know, how they're going to put the gangway out, or how, how should the gangway go down, you know, what's the best way to arrange this or arrange that. Generally speaking, um, it's not a problem. Um, there's always a young younger mariner than the captain. The mates usually tend to be younger than the captain. If you should happen to have a captain who doesn't speak English, you can usually talk to one of the young mates that likes, you know, American music and American culture, and they have, they probably will speak English. Makes sense. We touched on this already, um, but Paul says, realize you may not be able to comment officially for the Pilots Association, but any thoughts about the planned offshore wind terminal plan for Searsport? Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're supportive of the state's efforts to, to, you know, make something happen there. Um, I don't know what they're, you know, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. The Moffitt Nickel report was I think a pretty good first effort. They laid out uh, a pretty clear strategy of why they've settled on Searsport versus Eastport and Portland. Um, but I think you know my impression is that they're um, they're very early in the game. But I will say that you know Sprague, the operator at Mac Point, they've already demonstrated that they're very capable of of safely handling some very expensive equipment. So. We've already, we've already got a toehold in the wind industry. Now it's just that transition to, instead of importing everything and putting it together in Maine, let's start, you know, they're gonna to have to start importing stuff, but eventually, hopefully we'll be making some stuff here. And then the assembly thing happening in Searsport is gonna be the new change, but we're, we're optimistic and hope that it moves forward. I just, one thing I've said to the state is we just have to do it in such a fashion that it doesn't adversely impact existing operations existing cargo operations at Mac Point. There's only so much land available there. Thanks. Um, this one's a little bit further out there, but Mike asks, do you have information on Searsport in World War II? I don't, I don't. I wish I did. I love looking at old charts. It's amazing to me. There were actually like two other docks down there at Mac Point at one time, one to the west of the current docks and one to the east. And um, I don't. I don't. I, I really would like to know more. And we do have some fabulous images in our collection online of, of Searsport in World War II. Um, any other questions, anybody? Do you have any final thoughts? I really appreciate everyone's time. Again, I'm very sorry. I thought we had that technical stuff worked out yesterday, Gina, but Oh well, hopefully, hopefully everyone got the picture. I would, I would encourage folks to go and look at the website if they like those, um, if they like the videos. My partner, Captain Strong, uh, has done a great job over the last five or seven years, you know, videoing um, a lot of ship movements and boardings, and and uh, it's really informational. If you want to see what it's like a day on the job, that's a great, that's a great place to go. Yeah, I was watching some of those earlier, and they're pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you for speaking tonight. And thank you, everybody else for joining us.